Welcome to Broadcasting Common Ground, the Deep Foundation Institute's podcast channel. In this series, Interview with a Survivor, our hosts, Lucky and Tim, will be discussing near misses, problem projects, and resolutions. In today's episode, David Wilshaw of Integrity Drilling and Geophysical Services will step us through what to expect during litigation from an expert witness's perspective. Proudly brought to you by our series sponsor, Peer Research, and today's episode sponsor, Universal. Welcome back to DFI's podcast, Broadcasting Common Ground. I'm Tim Siegel, and I'm here with my co-host, Lucky Nagarajan. Hi, Lucky. Hey, Tim. Nice to be here again. Hey, great to be here, too. This is the fifth episode in our series, Interview with a Survivor, where our guests share their experience when problems arise in their projects, which is certainly no stranger to those of us in geotechnical engineering. Today, our guest is David Wilshaw. David is the president of Integrity Drilling and Geophysical Services, LLC. He has worn many hats in the past. He has been a foundation engineer, a geologist, and a professor, and much more. If you have been listening to our previous podcast in this series, then you know that our discussions have mainly been firsthand accounts. Uh, and also our last episode was an engineer who represented the owner of a project going through a problem. In this episode, we, we have a little more of a departure. David has agreed to share what it's like to be an expert witness. An expert witness is often called when we start to have problems or conflicts in projects. In this regard, David has testified in about 40 trials and has given over 160 depositions. That is certainly a lot for the lifetime of an engineer. And um, before we go into uh, bringing on David, what I'd like to do is to ask Lucky to tell us more about David's background. Tim, David and I go a long ways. <laughs> in fact, he was my first boss in this country. Um, he has about 34 years of experience in many facets of engineering from UK to USA. He's known as a smartest engineer who is extremely patient, attention to detail with a great sense of humor. You cannot deny that. Uh, many of us who have worked with him also know that we have never seen him lose his composure whatsoever. Also, this is something not many people know. He's a great cook and a blues guitarist. How cool, right? Um, I have to mention, he's also an actor. Um, he's been on numerous discovery and science shows explaining sinkhole phenomenon. Um, now let's welcome David Wilshaw. Hi, David. Nice to see you. Hi, Lucky. Hi, Tim. How are we today? Great, David. Great to have you with us. Well, thanks for asking me. It's a pleasure. Well, hey, since we're, we're kind of, uh, we're obviously talking about you right now. So maybe uh, if you would... Uh, for our listeners, share a little bit about your journey uh, as an engineer and maybe and focus on some of your professional highlights. Absolutely. I mean, you know, one thing about being a, an expert witness, you get used to talking about yourself. You, you lose some of that, uh, that, that sort of uh, shyness and self-deprecation that a lot of engineers have. Uh, but I, I grew up in, um, in, in England in a place called Stoke-on-Trent, which is a, a coal mining community in the, in the north part of England. Father was a coal miner, grandfather was a coal miner, great grandfather was a coal miner. It's one of those, you know. Um, so I was exposed to geology at an early age uh, because my, my father was friends with the, the chief scientist at the local coal mine. So he often brought home fossils and things of that nature. So I, I got interested at kind of high school in, you know, being able to uh, uh, look at these fossils and come up with a, you know, a, sort of a story of where they come from. So I studied geology through my uh, junior and senior years at high school, um, went on to university, University of London, where I, I read geology as my, my uh, degree. So I got a bachelor's degree in geology. I spent two crazy years out in the North Sea in the, in the oil and gas business as a, as a mud logging geologist, uh, working on a, a both uh, exploration uh, rigs and on, uh, on production platforms, uh, being the, the, the person who was responsible for, you know, safety of the well and and deciding what we're drilling through, things of that nature. 
Now, I got uh, laid off in the oil industry. First time I've ever been laid off, and the only time so far, thankfully. Uh, I got laid off in, in 86 when the, the price of oil went from $40 a barrel to $20 a barrel, and uh, many of us got laid off. So then I kind of re, re, uh, retreaded, I guess, re, uh, refocused on what I was doing. I'd done some engineering geology as part of my bachelor's degree, uh, and I enjoyed it. You know, it was, you know, construction related. It was something, you know, you could see in construction around when I was at college in London, lots of deep foundations going in, lots of uh, big construction projects underway. So I'd done some of that at, at undergrad. So I went back to school, went and did a master's degree in foundation engineering. So I did a geotechnical master's degree. Uh, and then from then on, from 87, when I finished that master's degree, I, I've worked as an engineering geologist. And um, there are very few engineering geologists in Florida, it has to be said, but you know, elsewhere in the US and worldwide, it is, you know, it is a profession where a professionally trained geologist will work in the civil engineering, construction and mining industries as a, as a specialist in, in the geotechnical aspects of geology, if you like. So, you know, I, I'm the sort of, although I've got a funny accent, as you'll agree, uh, I do translate geology into, engineer, into engineering language. To, uh, to help you know, engineers to understand the, the complexity and the, the, the history of the, the soils and rocks into which we, you know, we're, we're building foundations, we're putting structures on, we're, we're trying to retain, we're, we're trying to you know, tame, if you like. So, so since then, my background is in, in engineering geology. Um, I practiced in the UK until 2003. Uh, we had a kind of a lifestyle change in 2003. Uh, my wife's a, an RN. Uh, she had worked in the US before we met. She had a hankering to come back. So uh, we had a, a bottle of wine one night and ended up uh, applying for a job. Well, she applied for a job in California. So uh, before we knew it, we were living in Southern California. I was, I was being lowered down uh, two foot diameter boreholes to log the size of the borehole because that's what uh, engineering geologists do in California, looking for, for landslips and things of that nature. Um, and with a little bit of homesickness, we kind of thought, do we go home, come back? And we ended up in Florida a year later. We did the one year contract in California, uh, got on Route 66 and drove across here to Florida where we'd been on vacation before. Uh, and I became one of the very few engineering geologists in Florida. Um, I worked as a geotechnical engineer, really, although I'm a, I'm a geologist by, by training and licensure. Um, but I worked within that, that realm. I was a geotechnical manager for universal engineering. I've worked in uh, obviously a lot of work on sinkholes, which is, which is the biggest engineering geology problem we have here in Florida. So that's, that's my kind of little story, my little long ride on an elevator speech, but there it is. <laughs> that's that's very powerful uh, background, uh, David. Um, I was not aware of your father, your grandfather and great grandfather being a coal miner. <laughs> Um, that's that's really interesting story, and uh, uh, I've always, you know, wanted to ask you this question. Never did get a chance. Uh, was there a specific reason why geology was calling your name, and uh, you ended up in foundation engineering? Was there a specific uh, reason for the affinity? Well, I mean, I like I like geology as a science and a subject. I mean, but there were geology is a very broad church. You know, there are there are very many different careers you can have in geology. I started off in oil and gas because that's what was hiring at the time, really. I came out of college in 84 and, and there was a boom at the time. I ended up, you know, I, I had some adventures, you know, I worked in the Arctic Circle on a, on a, a semi-submersible rig up there. And, you know, that's in, in Norway and in Sweden and all over the North Sea. It was exciting stuff, you know, and it was a good, as a first job, you know, it's, it's you get exposed to so much stuff. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a great thing to do. But I didn't really see myself ending my career in oil and gas. It was just a, a job to get me, you know, out of college debt, you know, <laughs> which it did quite well, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I don't, oh, I've always been a kind of a practical guy. I've always um, enjoyed applying science to, to, to you know, day-to-day -day practice, if you like. So that's what engineering geology is. We, we work on, you know, we'll do the stability of the ground for a 7-Eleven. It doesn't need to be a huge structure, although I've worked on some pretty big projects like, you know, the Channel Tunnel and things like that, you know. So it doesn't have to be like that, but it can be stuff that you, you know, you can be a, a kind of a, a working professional in your local community, adding value to that community as, a, as just a knowledgeable geologist rather than being, you know, a kind of a, 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 a an ivory-towered professor who, you know, is only really applying research you know you're actually doing stuff which impacts people's lives so 
so I, that's how I got into engineering geology is that kind of applied geology that's that, that serves the community and, and and helps my fellow professionals yeah you know I it as you're talking I I can't help but remember George Sowers George Sowers was one of my professors at Georgia Tech and I think he was uh, certainly one of a few at the time that were really focused on the relationship between geology and geotechnical engineering, how important it was. It wasn't just a, a sidestep, but it was really a, a focus and uh, it, it had a great impact on me. Um, but um, what I'd like to really move on and, and really start focusing on our topic of today and, uh, and, and looking at, at, at being an expert witness and it, you know, it was several years ago when I went to school, but I can tell you that no one at the time, no, none of the professors talked to me about what, that there was such thing as an expert witness, uh, or even that, that, that geotechnical engineers would perform as such. That was completely absent. Um, how did you get your start, David? Uh, when did you kind of realize that there was this need and how did you come to meet that need? I think I started off just being as a, you know, as a, a professional that uh, looked at forensic problems. So I didn't really start off, you know, aiming to be an expert witness. I started looking at the, you know, uh, forensically at causes of ground failure. So my first um, probably experience of that was back in the early 1990s in the UK, where I think my first, uh, I was working for a, one of my mentors is a, a Dr. Dennis McNichol. He, he was my uh, a, a guy that took me under his wing and showed me how to approach a, a problem with a forensic approach. And it was the particular problem was a, a Victorian era rail tunnel uh, in the UK uh, where it was being um, improved and the, 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 they wanted to get larger trains through there, basically. So they were taking the, the bed of the, the tunnel down and, you know, giving it more, more headroom for the, the trains. Um, the rock was very complex there. They'd done a lot of high pressure dilatometer work, a lot of pressure meter work, try and see how the tunnel and the ground around the tunnel was going to behave. And it hadn't worked. There was, le there was leakage. There was, there were, you know, there, was, there were problems during construction. So coming in, looking at everything, every report that had been written, doing independent research into the geology, going out to the tunnel, going in the tunnel, seeing what was going on, seeing where the joint, uh, the, the main joint uh, sets were in relation to the tunnel lining and seeing, you know, where's a, a relationship with, you know, the inflow of water there. So that, that was my first, you know, and I was, then I was, you know, a, a few years out of my master's degree, but not that long. And then I, I carried on picking up those types of jobs because I enjoyed them really. And I, um, I like to ask the questions or what if, why, why did this happen? Why didn't, wasn't this done? So I gradually over time, I started doing more and more. So back in the UK, I think the, the, the biggest case I did was a, uh, a soil nailed slope, which had failed. The soil nails didn't go through a pre-existing periglacial shear surface. So that, that ended up in Crown Court, that ended up in court in London. Um, I'd actually left the, the UK by the time the case went to trial, but yet that was one where I worked for years to try and piece together what had caused this major slope failure, which is it would move an entire factory at the toe of the slope. So I mean, it was a big deal, you know. So, so were you in court for that? Did you did you end up testifying in court? On I, that I didn't. I, I didn't okay. at the time. No, because I'd left the uh, the country. I'd, I'd, gotcha. They they brought in another testifying expert. They they brought in actually you know Mike Defratis from Imperial College to to stand there. So I never got to testify. Um, I, I had been in. Uh, the county courts in, in Yorkshire, I'd, I'd sat there ready to go, I had the barrister with his wig on sitting next to me ready to go. And that was another slope failure. But this was one of those where they started to cross examine my client, who was the owner of the property, which had been damaged by the landslide. And, and then he, he unfortunately he admitted that he had actually dug a trench on a Sunday morning with a friend's excavator to try and improve the drainage. And then the, the landslide actually covered that, that trench up. So I'm looking at the barrister, the barrister's looking at me, and I, I said, well, that, I've done an analysis not assuming there's a, a six-foot deep trench been dug just before the landslide. So my analysis doesn't really hold water anymore. And the barrister just said, uh, we're out. <laughs> and the case settled right there. So that was the only time I got to court in the UK, and, but I never actually testified. So Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, just listening to the story and, and you know, how your involvement started as an expert witness and 
And the first story before leaving UK <laughs> is really interesting, <laughs> thinking about it. Um, some of our listeners, uh, David, uh, are not familiar with the legal system. Um, so can you give us some background or explain um, a role of an expert witness in our court system? Is it different from the fact witness or is it very similar to fact witness? Can you explain that a little bit? Absolutely. So, so for just to clarify, a fact witness is a is a somebody who observed something or or who did something, and they can only speak to the facts of what they did or you know what they and what they effectively what they did or what they wrote in their report. So, I mean, I've I've testified as a fact witness, and it's it, your your testimony is limited to to what you know or what you wrote down in your report. So, often if a if there's, if there's a lawsuit. You know, the engineer or geologist will will get called as a as a fact witness to testify what they did, and 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 to some extent there'll be cross examination, but you know it's it's not you're not giving a, an opinion. An expert witness is uh, obviously a, a qualified professional, either engineer, geologist, or or other professionals. You know, general contractor, you know, any any qualified person who can assist the judge and the jury to establish the, 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 the facts behind the, the case, if it not, in fact, not necessarily, but provide opinions and explanation to the jury and to the judge that would help the, uh, a verdict to be arrived upon. So, so you're there, I mean, they, they went in the UK, they, went, they tried doing a, a single joint expert witness at one stage, but nobody could agree on an expert witness. I don't think that, that ever worked in, in, in practice. So it does tend to be one side has one expert and the other side will have a different expert. And those experts will attempt to explain to the jury uh, and to the judge uh, what they perceive to be the, 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 an explanation of the problem or an explanation why it's not a problem. So, so we're not advocates, expert witnesses aren't meant to be advocates. The, 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 the lawyers are the advocates for the defendant and the plaintiff. The expert is there to assist the triers of the facts, if that makes sense. Sure. Oh, yeah. No, Definitely. It, it, it does. I mean, I guess, and in, in I, I think I understand from what you're kind of saying is that we, uh, an expert can develop opinions based on engineering rationale, and those opinions are accepted as fact in the court system, even though they're opinions, but they have to be based on, in, on, on engineering rationale. And you're certainly right. There can be two conflictory opinions in, in engineers, and sometimes uh, then it, and it comes down to a jury or a judge to see which explanation is is makes more sense to them. I think that's it. You know, so it's not what we do. What we deal in civil matters. We don't. You know, I haven't sure had to testify on a criminal matter. There's there's different standards of evidence i'm not obviously not an attorney i'm not i'm not trying to uh, give you any advice on the law because no i know plenty of attorneys that would have fun with that <laughs> no we're just trying i think what we're just trying to do is to get the our audience to kind of understand what the purpose of an expert witness is particularly in a in a civil court um so it's, most of the time there's a standard of evidence which is um, it's not beyond reasonable doubt, like a murder trial. You know, you, you see that on TV where you've got to prove somebody's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That doesn't really exist so much in civil uh, cases. There's, there's normally, it's it's 50% plus a feather. So, you know, the scales right. of justice can, you know, vary slightly. And, and that's often how cases are. There'll be, you know, if it's a, kind of a 50-50, there'll be something that maybe sways the jury to one side or the other. It doesn't have to be overwhelming evidence. Sure. That's kind of the difference between, you know, what we do in the civil uh, court system and what uh, a criminal justice system uh, requires. I believe the phrase that I've heard most often is to a reasonable degree of engineering certainty. And so, yes, a certainty or probabilities used. Sure. Um, again, how again, do you a re that? reasonable degree. But anyway, <laughs> What's a let's, degree? let's <laughs> but let us do this. Let us kind of move on and and let's get see, David. We we'd like to learn. Uh, your process uh, as has, how, and maybe you could walk us through that to help us understand uh, what it's like to be engaged, uh, who contacts you, kind of what kind of vetting process do you go through, uh, and then how, what would be your, you know, your initial steps? 
So most of the time I've been engaged by attorneys for the defense. I've done a lot of work on insurance, particularly on sinkhole insurance. The majority of my trial work has been on sinkhole insurance claims and, and the majority of time I've been retained by, um, by attorneys for the defendant there. I do other work. I do work for plaintiffs um, and you know, I've got some quite a lot of deposition testimony for, for plaintiffs. It hasn't not meant, well, none have gone to trial yet. I, I don't know how to read that personally, but uh, I've certainly given a lot of evidence and testimony uh, for plaintiffs. So, and again, I will be hired by uh, attorneys for the plaintiff usually. Uh, and I've been hired directly by individuals and corporations. So, and sometimes, you know, the, the attorney joins after I've been already hired and I've given my, my opinion. So, it, but the majority of the time you, you're, retained by an attorney acting for one party, they will often either try and give you a thumbnail sketch of the problem and, and see what your initial take on it is. So that might just be a, a conversation over the phone. They may send a set of documents or maybe just one out of a set of documents for you to look at and then gauge your opinion. Um, and depending upon how you, you know, give that opinion, what opinions you have based upon the information you're provided with, then they may engage you or they may not. And, you know, you know, I've looked at um, thousands of files when they've, 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 you know, they've been asked, well, what do you think about this? So, oof, yeah, that's, that's a sinkhole, for example. And then, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Click. Okay. And so once, you don't hear any more. So, so. <laughs> so you, once you give them the thumbnail and let's just say the attorney comes back and says, okay, David, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, we want to engage you. What's next? What should you, what are you prepared for? So I, often I don't prepare a report, which is, I, I found surprising as I started doing this. I thought, well, they're going to want my detailed opinions in a report. It's going to be signed and sealed and it's going to be submitted and everybody's going to read it and realize what a clever chap I am. Um, but really the, the attorneys don't like you to commit too much to, to paper. And some do, some have a preference. They'd rather have a report. Um, but really you, you give your opinions verbally. The attorney may take those opinions and put them into um, a, a document which will be submitted to the court. Mr. Wilshaw will say this, that, and the other. Uh, and you don't actually write it yourself. It's written for you by an attorney. Um, depending on the complexity of the case, I mean, you know, we could go visit the site. We could go look at the problem and get, you know, eyes and, eyes and feet on it and, and see what's going on. Uh, we might pull uh, soil samples that have been collected for a, a project and, and take a look at those and cross check those against the descriptions, because that can be often a stumbling block where you make an assumption that something's a clay sand, but in fact, it's a fat clay and that completely changes your opinion. So, um, you know, assumptions can be dangerous. So often we'll, we'll look at the, the soil samples and just check the, uh, what's there. You know, sometimes we'll get the entire file from an engineering company that's a, a party to the lawsuit and we'll go through every note and every email. We'll particularly go through the field logs taken by uh, hopefully an engineer that's supervising the driller, but often just the driller writing down the, the blow counts. Uh, make sure that everything that's in the field notes get, makes it to the report. So do that kind of due diligence element of it so that, you know, we, we don't want to find out, and it's happened to me, we don't want to be in the courtroom in front of the jury when the, the other side has an aha moment and uh, pulls out, well, do you realize, Mr. Wilshaw, that the, the blow counts recorded in the report don't match what the driller wrote down during the site investigation? And then you're lost. You know, you, you're basically done. Uh, collect your things and, and leave. It's one of those. So that's kind of a, you know, they're all, every case is different, but, you know, often... It's a review of uh, published uh, reports, review of kind of what's available to all sides, and then looking to, to see if there are any skeletons in the cupboard or, uh, and, and, and make sure that what you're going to put your opinion, your professional opinion is going to go down. It's going to be on the record. It's going to be transcribed in court. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you don't take the time to check on a few of the basic facts, then you're going you're gonna to be a foolish looking expert witness. Yeah, that's that that's definitely is not where you want to be for sure. <laughs> After accepting to be the expert witness, going through everything and then starting your um, engagement, like I don't think so. Um, I want to learn a little bit about depositions, uh, David. Uh, what is the real purpose of depositions? Why is it so, so important? 
So for those that don't know, a deposition is, is testimony under oath. So um, these Zoom days, we, we, I've been doing them over Zoom for the last couple of years, obviously, but uh, usually you go to a court reporter's office or to an attorney's office. There'll be a, a court reporter there who will transcribe every word that's said, every mm, every aha, uh -huh, um, they all get written down. So you got to try and, particularly me, I often do it, um, <laughs> and they'll do it. You know, everything is transcribed. Everything's taken down. Uh, you will be sworn in, so you're under oath. You're under oath to tell the truth. And you will be asked a series of questions by the, the adverse, adversary attorney, the opposing attorney, I guess is the best way of putting it. So they will establish whether you are qualified to be an expert. They will ask a number of searching questions about your background. You know, they'll, they'll ask you about your criminal background, any, any convictions, any, any complaints against your license. That they'll build a picture of you as a as an expert witness, as a, and as a person, as a person of integrity, or, or of you know, if you've got some background in there, that that, that will be brought out. If they you've done something that you regret in the past, it, you know, they'll ask you at depot, and it'll come out at trial. So, so you've got to be honest. Tell them everything you, you about you that you you know you, you know, and then the, a series of questions will be asked about your opinion, and they, those questions will be asked in a way to help their case. So they'll try and get you to say something on the record which they can use uh, against your opinion. So they'll, they'll try and ask a question with a yes, no answer. Yes, no answer is a favorite, you know. Isn't it true, sir, that there are sinkholes in Temple? Yes or no? So those are type of questions. And then those, those little snippets of questions add into their general approach at trial. So they're after your, all your opinions. Also, what they want to do is to find out everything you're going to testify about. So if you come up with an opinion at trial that you didn't give during your deposition, they'll object and you'll be, you won't be allowed to give that opinion. So you're supposed to say everything you're going to tell, tell to the jury and the judge that, that goes in the depot. Now, if they don't ask the question and you know the defense side asks a question that they didn't ask, well, there's, there's a bit more uh, kind of flexibility there. But the, there is an opportunity for the, the other side, either defense or plaintiff, after the first set of questions have been asked to, to ask kind of additional questions. And they'll, they'll try and clean up any areas where you've got in trouble during the depot, you've got yourself in a bit of a, a, bit of a corner and the, you know, you've been uh, hemmed in and you've had to say something that doesn't help the other side's case. Uh, so, so then you'll, there was an opportunity then, and then there'll be a, a, another set of rebuttal questions until everybody is kind of as happy as they're going to be about what you've put on the record. And then it'll get transcribed and typed up. You have opportunity to read back everything you've said uh, and, and remember what your opinions are. If the trial comes up in three years' time, you get the opportunity to, well, this is what I said three years ago. So, uh, you know, so uh, hopefully your opinions haven't changed, although sometimes, you know, you, you find things out as a professional that change your opinions. So often people's, people's opinions are different several years later, but, but you get a written record of what you said, and that's, that's very helpful. David, there's, a, for our listeners, there's a little bit of a disconnect, maybe those that have never been through a deposition, um, you know, one statement you made is that they just really want to know your opinions that you're going to give at trial, but then you use terms like cornered and, uh, you know, almost like there's a conflict taking place or maybe, you know, in a, not necessarily in a playful sense, but almost a game that's, that's underway during a deposition. Um, is it stressful? Do you, do you find yourself, uh, and I mean, maybe we can talk about your early on depositions, knowing you're going into that. Did you feel stress going in preparation for those? Yes. I mean, there's obviously the, the first few times you do it, there's a stress of a new experience. And I mean, you, I think you, you wouldn't be human if you didn't feel, you know, sort of under attack because you are really that to kind of clean up what we said about the opinions that they're trying to limit your opinion. So limit what you can say. So they will box you into certain, certain opinions uh, and then that just gives you less latitude to expand upon that at trial so that you know these yes and no answers well you said at deposition this was a yes no and you said yes so you know you can't give any further opinions to the contrary so yes it is stressful I mean it's um 
you know, it's a, even, even I've done 160 of them and you never know how the question is going to go. You know, you can have, you know, be, and in fact, to a certain extent, you know, the, the first few, you know, you get, you get com more comfortable with it and then they'll start asking questions based upon transcripts from previous depositions. So and when you get to this, my stage where you've done over 150 of the things, you know, you know, or didn't you, under deposition under oath, you, you swore under oath that uh, this was the case in this deposition from 2015, what's changed your opinion? And, you know, and it's a, that's, you know, it's a game. Um, you haven't, probably haven't changed your opinion. It may have been stated slightly differently, you know, and particularly for me as a geologist, you know, the ground's not all the same, you know, it does, it does vary from location to location. So you have to explain that and explain why your opinions for that particular case or those particular circumstances might be different in this case. So, so, but, but that's, you know, that's particularly when you've got a body of work behind you in, in deposition, you know, they will, they will pick out um, areas where they think they can, again, just limit your testimony, limit your effectiveness, because, you know, you, you, you've been hired as an expert witness to give, you know, your opinion to guide the jury and the judge on a verdict. So if they can limit your ability to do that at deposition, then, then they will. So it's time for our sponsor break. Say thank you to our uh, sponsor, Universal Engineering Sciences, uh, you know, for this episode. Um, also, we have uh, Ricardo Kirikidis. Um, he's from the Universal Engineering Sciences, and uh, Ricky and I go way back too. Uh, for both of us, David were, was our first boss in this country, uh, right, Ricky? Um, and uh, I think Ricky and I both uh, have great memories of dabbling into world of foundations uh, together, <laughs> starting our career together. Um, so Ricky has uh, about two decades of experience covering all areas of geotechnical engineering. So 400 design projects over uh, 2,500 forensic exploration projects and 500 subsurface remediation projects throughout Florida under his belt. Uh, I'm sure counting is still on. Um, hey, Ricky, nice to see you. Thank you and UES. Hey, Loki, how you doing? Good to see you again. And Tim, nice to meet you. And David, of course, always good to see you. Um, Amen, Ricky. Now, you know, I've, I've been listening to... to what Dave's been explaining, it's pretty interesting. Um, and I got a couple of, of I guess, follow-up questions on some of the topics that he mentioned that some of the viewers or, or the listeners may like to, to know a bit more. Um, one of them that's always, you know, comes to mind is that most people, the, the only, I guess, exposure to, to our legal system is from TV. It's what people see on TV, what they see on the TV shows. And, and you know, kind of like, on your take, you've got a lot of experience. What's what's the difference that you see from you know the the theatrics of TV and and what you see in real life? Hey, Ricky. Yeah, great question. So, I mean, theatrics is the best word to use <laughs> because um, it is it can be the theatre of the absurd sometimes in court. But it's a uh, again, it's you're trying to engage a jury of, of in civil trials. It's you know six or well, six people plus a spare. You have a, a, a a spare in case somebody gets sick. So there's seven people in the in the jury. So often the the, um, the there is theatrics involved. There are there is you know certain uh, attorneys from both defence and plaintiff side will you know will will try to make it entertaining for the jury. Let's be fair, uh, but it's not it's not quite as entertaining as a TV show because it goes on. I mean my my testimony typically I'm I'm in and out you know in an hour and a half two hours. So it's it's not um, but it's still quite a long time for the jury to listen to a an old English guy talking about rocks, you know, so it can still, you still got to keep them engaged. Uh, the longest testimony, I, had, I testified in Miami for eight hours. I was, that was, that was the poor jury. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what they were asking me for, for all that time, but it is, it is, it is theatrical, but it's also, uh, I imagine for, I've never been a juror, but I imagine the jury must find it quite tedious to listen to particularly, you know, very, in-depth technical arguments so it, it would make a, a netflix series rather than a, you know a snappy episode most of the time no and and you know to that same effect something that tim mentioned too was that you know how the it's a stressful for anybody to go in um so what's your preparation before this particularly you know you always see 
each side has their own expert. Um, and sometimes you'll hear the expert say something that goes against, I guess, the normal school of thought, I would say, or the normal science. How, how, you know, how do you prepare to that to just keep your composure during those events? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to, you know, I mean, we're all, we're all professionals, you know, we're all licensed professionals that do this as expert witnesses. So, and, you know, and you, you can't criticize a fellow professional, you know, you, they're, they're, they're doing, they're giving their opinion, you know, and that's the same. They, they, they disagree with my opinion, you know, it's, it's the way it is. Uh, you, you don't get into an adversarial position with the other experts because, you know, we're all just doing our job as professionals. So we, we avoid that. We leave that to the attorneys. We let the attorneys go at, at that. Um, so, you know, I've heard other experts testify and sometimes the judge will allow us to sit in during their testimony. And, and that's quite interesting because they see you. I mean, again, it's theater. You're sitting at the, the back of the, the courtroom and go, yeah, and they can see you. <laughs> so, that you know, and it's, it's tactics. So often, you know, the, the judge will get, uh, have appeals. Get these people out of the room, please, Your Honor. You know, they're, they're affecting the testimony of our expert. But a bit, yeah, again, it's, it can be theater. So, um, yeah, but I mean, uh, we, we, we give our own opinions. We don't testify that the other expert's wrong. That, that's the big thing about it. And, you know, and I think as professionals, you'd, you'd, you'd appreciate that, you know, because, because, you know, they think I'm wrong too. And they're not, but their experts don't stand up and say, well, Mr. Wilshaw, you know, is, is just, just arrived here off, off of a boat from the UK and he knows nothing. Their attorneys say that, <laughs> and, I've, <laughs> and I've had worse. <laughs> I've been called all sorts by attorneys for the other side, but the other experts won't, and we, we don't do it either. So we just have to, if you're going to try and undermine the other experts' argument, you do it technically. You do it professionally, and you do it, you know, as, in a way that the you don't appear to the jury that you're just a, you know, a hit man for the other side. It's very good. And, you know, to that, I guess, one final question would be, like you said, we're all scientists by trade. Um, so we we'll usually rely on, on what we know, what we've learned, what we've seen. Now the attorneys though, they, they have a different upbringing. They're not really technical in the sense, they're more argument, it's their, their trade. Um, so, you know, often you'll give an answer to them and it seems that they're repeating the same answer over and over again, but you know, a lot of times they're just changing one word that may change the whole, I guess, meaning of it. So. How do you, I guess, defend against that, I would say? Yeah, that's probably the most, uh, most, one of the most stressful parts of it is that heightened awareness. And it's keeping that heightened awareness of what the question is and what words have been used in that question. Um, and that, that's what, you know, that's, that's when you're burning a lot of energy trying to keep on top of that in, you know, in uh, both direct and cross-examination, in deposition and at trial. At trial, certainly more so because you, you, it's a live gig, you know. So, so words really matter. And I think as a, if was, anybody wants to take anything away from this podcast from an expert witness, words matter. Spoken words matter, particularly when they're put on the record in a deposition. Uh, written words matter. Emails matter. Text messages matter. They've all, I've seen them all come out in trial. So, you know, uh, a question is, like I say, you, you could change one word and change the emphasis of a, a question. You could answer and use the wrong word, which completely undermines your testimony if you, if you don't choose your answers carefully. So you've got to be fast on your feet and you've got to listen. You've got to, be a, you've got to make sure that you understand the meaning of the words. And if you don't understand, ask them to rephrase the question. That's I've used that to buy time, you know, you just, oh, could you rephrase that and just ask the question in a different way, maybe, you know, just to give yourself a little bit of thinking space, because uh, you know, all, the, all the attorneys are no doubt watching this, because they will, <laughs> will, will, uh, will tell you that words really matter. Great. Thank you so much, Ricky. It was really great to see you. And uh, thank you for asking those questions. Tough questions to David. <laughs> Thanks, Ricky. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Good to meet you, Ricky. Okay, so we're coming back from our break with our sponsor, Universal Engineering. Uh, David was, uh, we were engaging him with the, his uh, experience giving testimony, whether it's in during deposition or during trial. Um, 
you know, and we talked about the opposing expert as well. And those of us that have been around the industry a few years, you know, this term comes out the hired gun and it, it, in, and instantly you think of this Western gunslinger that, you know, has no allegiance and is ready to shoot anybody on site for a certain amount of pay. Um, David, have you, what's been your experience? Have you, have you encountered someone that would fit that category and, and what was that like? Yeah. So, I mean, again, people have accused me of being a hired gun. So, I mean, you know, you know, he who lives in a glass house should throw no stones sometimes because, you know, most of my testimony, well, all my trial testimony has been on behalf of insurance companies. So I've, I've been called, I've been called a lot worse than hired gun. I can tell you and on the record as well, which I was surprised by, but so uh, I think uh, as long as you are, uh, you know, as an expert, you have the kind of the integrity to be able to um, to give opinions to both sides and don't just say, I don't work for homeowners or I don't work for insurance companies. Then I think you can avoid that that uh, that label as a hired gun. But there are professionals, engineers, geologists who who've stated on the record that, you know, I will never work for an insurance company. I, you know, I only work for the plaintiffs, you know, and I, I think that's fine if you're a lawyer. I mean, most lawyers pick the side, they're either plaintiff attorneys or, or defense. Some, some do both. Some do both. I've got a few, few people I know who do both, which kind of gets awkward because they've been on your defense side on one case and then all of a sudden they're the plaintiff, but it's, you know, they, they can do it. Um, but as a, as a, Again, as a professional, I think you have to just look at the facts. You just have to look at the science. And you can't you kind of shoehorn an opinion onto some bad facts. If you've got ground conditions that scream, this is a, you know, an imminent cover collapse sinkhole, you've got to get the people out of the house. You can't just say, well, I don't really think it's a sinkhole. Because, I mean, you, know, you, you might, you're a professional, you've got a license, you, know, you might you know, cause damage. You might harm somebody by having that opinion. So you really just got to, and I think anyway, if somebody comes to you with a, you know, a set of facts, you make your own opinion. Um, and they can call me a hired gun or worse, which they have. But really, if you look at the body of work I've done, I've said I've disagreed with my potential client many, many times. And I've never, they're, the, they're not the cases you do depositions and trials on because you, you come up with an opinion which is contrary or opposite to what they, they want to hear. So so I think, you know, it's, um, I mean, in trial, um, you know, it can get a little bit kind of outlandish, what people will say, and which I, I don't do, you know, I try and, you know, which is why I've done lots of them, really, is I, I you know, I've not been kind of impeached, there's another term we could talk about, I've not been prevented from testifying because of, of some outlandish thing I've said in, a, in another case. So, um, So, you know, it's a, if, if you do start saying fairly outlandish things just to try and win the case for your client, then, you know, you don't tend to do many more trials because you become, you know, an, an, what's known as an impeachable expert witness. David, if, if you, I remember as when we started working together, uh, working on so many sinkhole projects around uh, uh, central Florida um, and in your, uh, uh, previous uh, explanation, you were talking about you work a lot with insurance companies. I remember 20, 2003, 2004, a lot of insurance companies left Florida, right? Like they decided that, no, we are not going to continue uh, working on uh, providing insurances because of all the things that were happening in terms of failure of, you know, sinkholes and failure of uh, the, the structures and um, everything else that followed that. Has that changed any way uh, from 2004, 2005? I'm sure it must have changed now, right? Yeah, so I mean, it's, I mean, uh, for, the, for those outside of Florida, you, you probably, you may not have a full understanding of what uh, the insurance is like for sinkhole loss in, in, in Florida. We have a, since the, the Winter Park sinkhole, which is a 1981 event, it would got national coverage, you know, a 300 foot diameter sinkhole opened up in Winter Park, Florida, which is just to the, to the north of Orlando. Um, it was on all the TV news, there was helicopters above. I mean, it, it, um, it, it uh, took part of a, an automotive dealership where they did kind of luxury cars. So we got Porsches and BMWs falling down this hole in the ground. You know, it was a big, it was a big deal. So it got, it got the legislature in, uh, in Florida 
engaged and they started to write um, the requirement to have sinkhole insurance into, into Florida insurance law. So that was that was eventually made its way in. Um, as you rightly point out, you know, 2004, 2005 in particular, we had a lot of hurricanes in Florida. Um, you know, as first, I, I arrived in Florida the day of Hurricane Charlie, you know, so I, I'm partly responsible. So, uh, but we had a lot of hurricanes and 2005, we went all the way through the alphabet, some big storms, you know, so, you know, including, you know, uh, Wilma, I think was the last big one we had in, in 2005, but, you know, uh, we had Katrina that year, of course. So, um, so a lot of insurance companies left the state after that because of the storm damage. So the, Florida has an insurer of last resort called Citizens Property Insurance. So that's, that's the state of Florida insurance corporation. So they got left holding the bag with all the properties that were now uninsured because you know, the national insurance companies had, had left the state and wouldn't write policies in the state. So come 2006, 2007, Citizens has got most of the policies. And then there was a recession and everybody's houses were worth a lot less than they paid for them and people were upside down on their mortgages. So there was a, people tried to find ways of getting out of a problem. So a lot of people decided to, well, I've got this sinkhole insurance coverage. I'm going to put a claim in for sinkhole coverage. And a lot of people got, you know, good payouts from their insurance companies. So that eventually made its way to the uh, attention of the legislature in Florida, as you can imagine, because Citizens was the main insurer and it's a state run insurance company and there's lots of losses and, and it was starting to get uncomfortable. It, it was hitting the budget. So they, they basically rewrote the law in 2011 and made it more strict. It was a, it was a, a law that you had to have structural damage to the building, but elsewhere in the law, it said you had to have physical damage to the building. So physical damage can be, you know, a crack in the stucco. Structural damage is, as an engineer, you, you, you have a, a definition. So they rewrote re, uh, the, the, the legislation in 2011, and they defined what structural damage is. Uh, and that slowed down the claims a lot. So that's, that's the kind of story of, uh, of sinkhole insurance claims in Florida. And that's why I you know, I, I represented, uh, well, I didn't represent, I was, I was an expert witness for citizens' property insurance for, on a number of trials following those claims from, you know, the early part of, of the millennium. So, David, um, I want to ask you, I know um, concept of standard of care, right, uh, is very important when you are uh, doing what you're doing. Um, I want to discuss a little bit of, uh, you know, concept of standard of care and also um, how is it determined, you know, is there a difference between human care and negligence when you're working on the cases that you're talking about? Sure. So, so you know, again, that's one of the things we do, that there isn't really a defined standard of care. So if you're a manufacturer making, I guess, seat belts for cars, there's a code and a standard that you have to adhere to that makes sure that those seat belts don't break if there's an accident or like an airbag or something like that. You know, there's a standard for to, to, um, to carefully manufacture those to a, a, step, a set standard. The ground, as we know, <laughs> uh, the ground doesn't really behave that way. The ground is heterogeneous. You know, it's, it's different everywhere. It's a it's a, a set of conditions that have been uh, built up over tens of millions of years. And it's a dynamic system. The ground is dynamic, mainly because of the action of groundwater. So the flow of groundwater through the ground. And I'm not just talking about Florida here. I think this is a, a worldwide kind of, you know, engineering sort of acceptance that the ground is different. So standard of care really comes into how much effort should you take or make in being able to characterize that ground and come up with a, a model of how that ground is going to behave. Uh, and, you know, have you done enough to ensure the health, safety and welfare of the eventual end users of the, uh, of the, the project? When we're looking at forensic um, work, then we're looking at, well, was everything done before construction to, to make that uh, you know, that, that make that ground model as, as realistic as you could reasonably expect it to be. So, you know, if you can go from, you know, somebody doing a drive-by on a site and saying, yeah, it looks like it's just all sand dunes, we're going to be fine here, and not doing anything, to doing a very comprehensive geotechnical investigation. The standard of care becomes an issue on the back end if something goes wrong, when, you know, the, the engineer or geologist will be 
you know, put uh, feet against the fire saying, well, why didn't you do more? You know, why didn't you carry out more investigation? So it's a bit, I don't really answer your question, Lockie, but I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very project specific, but it comes down to what the, the if, you, if you're in trial, what would the jury think as reasonable non-practitioners, did you do enough? And that can come down to how much money you were spent, you know, uh, and, and all that comes out in discovery when you're in trial, you know, if, if you if you only charge the client twenty five hundred dollars for the investigation and, you know, it was a, a multi million dollar project, then, you know, you the jury aren't going to think you met the standard of care just as reasonable lay, lay men and lay women. Whereas if you've you've done everything, you've tried all the different techniques available. Um, and it still went wrong, then your standard of care wouldn't be an issue, I would imagine. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, while you were talking with uh, um, Ricky, I think you mentioned some of the things that you just said, and also it makes sense, you know, how different it can be and how human error versus negligence can lead to what we are talking about, right, which is very important to uh, uh, consider uh, when you're on a case like this. Um, that brings me to an important question, actually. I know you did mention a few minutes ago about cross-examinations, right? I'm, I don't think it will be fun, right? Like, I'm just talking about seeing the uh, uh, Netflix shows where <laughs> cross-examination happens. I'm sure it is not exactly like that. So um, I want to ask you, uh, it probably happens on almost every trial. Um, what was it like to be cross-examined? So, so it's a, again, it's a you're in trial as an expert uh, as any witness probably but you, so you, the the person that's called you as the expert goes first usually although it doesn't always happen but usually the person that's that this is my expert geologist mr wilshaw he's going to tell you what a what a clever chap he is and he's going to explain the problem at hand and you know you're going to agree with him aren't you members of the jury so they they uh, you know the, the the side that's engaged the expert will ask the questions um that are geared towards getting the the, the, the impression to the jury of, of what the, the preferred answer is, if you like. So that's what the attorney's job, not the expert's job. The expert answers the questions. And we can only answer the, the questions that are asked to us. That's one thing about being an expert. You, it's a team effort with the attorneys on both sides, really. You know, you, you, you're only allowed to answer the questions. You can't just go on and give a speech. You know, I try, don't worry. <laughs> but you, you can't go out there and just give a, a lecture to the jury. You, you have to answer specific questions. And if, if you go wandering off, as often I do, then there'll be an objection from the other side and you get, you get reined back in. So the cross-examination is when kind of all bets are off because you don't know what they're going to ask you. And they don't really know what, you can, what your answer is going to be. So... As I talked earlier about a deposition, the, the, the opposing party will try and limit your uh, testimony to the jury. They're going to try and limit what you can say to convince that jury that, you know, that you're on the right side of the case here. In cross-examination, there's no such restrictions. So um, the, the, the opposing attorney has to be pretty careful not to ask you a question that you're just going to riff on and come up with some great theories that are going to help your case. So so the questions tend to be, you know, fairly, um, you know, they're, they're trying to undermine you as an expert, really. They're not really interested in your opinion sometimes, you know, although if they there's something they really want to kind of, you know, beat down on, they, they will. But they will, they will try and find areas where, you know, they can just undermine your credibility as a witness. That's, that's the purpose of cross-examination. So it'll be, you know, Mr. Wilshaw, you, you've never taken a class in geology, have you, in, in Florida? So, but no. So, you know, I'd answer, you know, well, I, I taught a class on the geology of Florida at Valencia College, you know, but I hadn't sat a class in geology. You're right. I, had, I didn't go to school here, you know. So that's the type of thing. They'll just try and take away, you know, they'll just, they'll just paint, paint you as a hired gun. They'll go through, they'll go through uh, all of the invoicing that you've done for that particular client, you know, and, and they'll paint you as, a, as somebody who does it for money, you know, so they'll, they'll bring out all your 1099s and they'll, they'll put all that in evidence. So they just undermine your credibility. So that's, that's when you've got to just stick by your guns, keep your technical opinions, you know, you know keep, your, keep your integrity in, in terms of your technical opinions and just don't rise to it because, you know, it's just going to, if you lose your temper and you start to argue back with them, they love that, you know, if you start to argue back, it just makes you look like, yeah, they're right, this attorney's got this guy. You know, he's, yeah, look at him, he's cracking, he's crumbling under it, you know. So you just got to, you know, keep that even temper. <laughs> 
Thank you, David. That was excellent. Um, so we have been talking to David, and he's been sharing with us his uh, expertise. We've learned that um, his backgrounds in in geology as well as engineering, and he is uh, geology is a key part of his background and a key part of his his profession now and his his service as an expert in the court system. Um, David explained to us that the uh, role of an expert is to provide engineering opinions to the court based on engineering rationale, and those opinions are accepted as fact. We realize that there are usually two sides, uh, and while they're not advocates of, and they're not to be served as, serve as advocates, they tend to have conclusions that are favorable as they are assigned uh, to that side. Uh, he shared with us some differences between um, negligence and human error and uh, focusing on really just saying that, uh, for example, if you do a thorough geotechnical exploration as, as your, uh, someone else would, someone competent in your area and at your time would do that, uh, that would seem to indicate that you met the standard of care, even though there is so, still some room with human error in the variability of the subsurface conditions. And that's kind of inherent in our, our practice. Um, he also shared with us just that during a deposition and in trial, uh, the opposing attorney has a, a vested interest and, and he is going to be a, an advocate for his client. And he's got a vested interest in trying to impeach us or, or impeach the uh, expert witness and try to uh, get it so that their opinions are, are removed from consideration by the court system. David, I want to, I want to say how much I appreciate you being willing to uh, being deposed by me and uh, Lucky today. <laughs> no, thank you, David. Thank you for sharing your adventure. Uh, you know, as an expert witness, I, I, I always uh, stalk you on uh, LinkedIn and I've seen so many posts and it was really great to hear some of the stories, you know, um, also, I'm, I can say that it's not everyone's cup of tea for sure. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you one last thing. Uh, what is most important uh, to you as a successful, inspiring engineer and also as an expert witness? So um, I, I think that uh, often uh, engineers and geologists are like, I'll, I'll, I'll lump us all together. We don't appreciate how good we are, you know. Um, it's only when you are, you know, you, 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 if you put yourself forward as an expert and somebody asks you, well, what are your qualifications? What qualifies you to do this? And we're, you know, we're not very good sometimes at, at promoting ourselves. And I think, you know, we, we're great at what we do. We, are, we have such a specialty knowledge that most, I mean, again, try and explain this to, you know, six members of the jury who made it through kind of jury selection. They won't have any background in engineering. They, you know, they may have know a little bit about building. They won't know anything about geology most of the time, except that you know they made a volcano in fifth grade. Uh, so, you know, it's you've got to as a as a professional, we're really good, but we have to um, engage people who don't have all the years of experience and training that we have. Uh, and I think this this is, transcends just expert witness work. I think you're going to have you know owners and clients who don't know what you're talking about. We can talk in jar jargon about SPTs and CPTs and small strain stiffness of soils. It's just white noise. So I think we're, we're, we're good at what we do. Uh, we can be better communicators, I think, sometimes. And I think communication, you know, not just about, you know, the budget and, and everything else, but the actual why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we drilling holes into the ground? You know, I'm, you know, I'm never going to see the benefit of these holes. We've got to be better at communicating that. So, and I think my, as my expert witness role, you know, having to an hour and a half maybe to convince six people that not only am I, you know, the cleverest guy in the room, but, you know, this is what's happening underground. And let me tell you the geologic history of the last 35 million years in the next 10 minutes. But so that, so communications is the skill really. Um, and, you know, if we can do that as a, as a profession, I think, you know, we, we continue to be brilliant people. Um, we just got to tell everybody how brilliant we are. Thank you, David. That was, uh, that was awesome. Thank you so much for being here with us. 
Thanks, David. Thank you all. of DFI, we hope you enjoyed this episode. The views, information and opinions expressed during Deep Foundation Institute's podcasts are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of DFI. DFI does not verify or take responsibility for the accuracy of the information contained, nor does it warrant that the information contained herein is suitable for any general or specific use. The podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. Editing, modification or redistribution of this podcast is prohibited. Proudly brought to you by our series sponsor, Peer Research and today's episode sponsor, Universal. Thanks for your time. Keep on surviving.